Welcome back to another Space News Update. Lots to cover once again, as SpaceX launched two Falcon 9s on the same day, both carrying Starlink payloads and both stages flying their 14th flights, with one being SpaceX's 200th ever Starlink mission. Starship development also continued at full speed, with the first full cryoloading of the first version 2 Starship, marking SpaceX's biggest ever ship cryoload, thanks to the enlargement of the vehicle's fuel tanks from version 1 to version 2. There was lots of human spaceflight activity up on Earth's two space stations, the Freedom Dragon was relocated to a different docking port on the International Space Station, and we saw a crew rotation aboard China's station, with the arrival of Shenzhou-19 and the departure of Shenzhou-18. NASA made some more progress towards the construction of Artemis II's SLS. Military satellites were launched by both Russia and Japan, the latter being the H3 rocket's first GTO payload, and much, much more. Enjoy. The hot topic at Starbase right now is Ship 33. This is the very first version 2 Starship, which was rolled out of Mega Bay 2 for the first time not too long ago and transported to the Massey's test site to begin its cryotesting campaign. This began and concluded over the course of last week. Activities started on Tuesday, where we saw only partial loading of liquid nitrogen into both the methane and oxygen tanks. The following day, another cryo test was conducted, and this time things lasted a little longer. We saw both fuel tanks completely filled with liquid nitrogen, as evidenced by the frost extending all the way up the side of the vehicle the midway gap indicating where one tank ends and the other begins. This also shows us one way in which the V2 ships differ from the V1s. The tanks are stretched and can therefore contain more fuel. Lab Padre shared a cool little gif comparing the fuel levels of Starship 33 versus Ship 31, which also does a nice job showing how much smaller and more leeward the forward flaps are on the V2 vehicle. Cryotesting didn't end there though. One day later, Thursday, saw another round of cryoloading as the cover of night fell, once again showing another apparent full loading of liquid nitrogen into the tanks. After its three cryotests, it seemed that SpaceX was satisfied with things as the road was closed and Ship 33 was returned to Mega Bay 2 in the early hours of Saturday. Over at Launchpad 2, things are really coming together with well, the launch pad, I guess. <laughs> Two new sections for the launch mount arrived on Wednesday, and the first module of the launch mount's second level was stacked and later secured to the lower level. This assembly is currently at the production site and will be moved to the actual final launch pad location at a later date. NASA Spaceflight's Jack Beyer took some aerial footage of the second launch pad last week. The two most notable things you can see here are the tower itself and the excavation site for the flame diverter, that long rectangular thing by the tower. Over at Launchpad 1, we saw some chopstick testing last week. Monday saw the arms being raised to the top of the tower, which is their position during super heavy catches, where they were opened and swung left and right. And if you look closely, you can see the tower actually wobbles a bit due to the forces enacted by these movements. Speeding up the footage generally makes this a little bit easier to see. Thursday saw some smaller testing of the arms closer to ground level, just above the launch mount, performing similar left to right swings. On the subject of Pad 1, NASA Spaceflight captured several shots of work being done on the Booster Quick Disconnect structure, as well as lots of ongoing work with the chopstick arms. Falcon 9 flew twice over the past seven days. These were both Starlink missions and both launched on the same day, crazily. The launches took place on Wednesday, with the first lifting off from Vandenberg with 20 satellites on board, while the second launched from Cape Canaveral Pad 40, carrying 23 Starlinks. The Vandenberg launch happened to be the 200th Starlink launch by SpaceX, and as for the two Falcon 9 first stages, they both made successful touchdowns on the drone ships Of Course I Still Love You and A Short Fall of Gravitas. Funnily enough, this was the 14th successful mission for both boosters. Up in space, we saw activities aboard both the International and the Chinese space stations. On Sunday, Crew-9 astronauts Nick Haig, Butch Wilmore, Sonny Williams, and cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov all boarded the Freedom Crew Dragon spacecraft in order to relocate the vessel from the forward-facing port to the space-facing port of the International Space Station's Harmony module, in order to make way for the arrival of SpaceX's 31st Crew Resupply Cargo Dragon mission, expected to launch no earlier than tomorrow after being scrubbed yesterday yesterday for currently undisclosed reasons, though weather conditions were quite windy, and the call-out at the hold indicated a possible Stage 1 helium issue, though SpaceX have stated that the vehicle and payload remain healthy. 
Anyway, the relocation of the Freedom Dragon marked Butch and Sonny's fourth flight aboard a unique spacecraft. They've each both flown aboard the Space Shuttle, Soyuz, Starliner, and now Dragon. Very few astronauts can say they've flown in four different spacecraft. The only other astronaut to fly on four different classes of spacecraft is John Young, who flew aboard Gemini, the Apollo Command and Service Module, the Apollo Lunar Lander, and the Space Shuttle. And if you would count the Lunar Lander and Apollo as the same vehicle, then, and comment below if I'm wrong here because I'm genuinely curious, I believe Butch and Sonny are the only two people to have flown in this many distinct spacecraft. Freedom Dragon wasn't the only spacecraft docking and undocking last week. Over in China last Tuesday, we saw the launch of Shenzhou-19, the eighth crewed mission to the Tiangong space station, carrying three Taikonauts on board, Commander Kai Shuzi, Operator Song Lingdong, and Engineer Wang Huaos. The Shenzhou spacecraft docked with the forward docking port on the Tianhe core module of the station, and the crew successfully boarded, taking over operations from the Shenzhou 18 crew, and continuing with experiments to assist in China's ambitions in landing a manned mission on the moon by the end of the decade. As for the Shenzhou 18 crew, Commander Ye Guanfu, Operator Li Kong, and Science Operator Li Guansu boarded their own spacecraft and made a successful departure and return to Earth, landing safely yesterday at the Dongfeng landing site, though the retro rockets on the capsule make the landing look a little bit more dramatic than it actually was. Shenzhou-19 wasn't the only launch from Asia last week. We also saw JAXA launch their H3 rocket earlier today from the Yoshinobu launch complex at the JAXA Tanegashima Space Center, carrying the DSN-3 communication satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit, the very first GTO launch for the H3 vehicle. The satellite itself is an X-band communication satellite used for the Japanese military, so as such, not a whole lot of information has been shared about it. Over at NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building, Artemis II's SLS has had its spider installed on its core stage. The spider is that yellow cone piece at the end of the core, and now it's on, a crane can attach to it and lift the entire core stage vertical for continued vehicle assembly of the Artemis II rocket. On the 31st of October, Russia launched a Soyuz 2.1A from the Blasetska Cosmodrome. The payload was most likely the BARS M6L reconnaissance satellite, though little about this launch has been shared by the Russian Ministry of Defense. Blue Origin are getting closer and closer to launching their first ever orbital rocket after over two decades in the business. The massive first new Glenn booster has been transported from the Blue Origin production facility to Launch Complex 36, carried by Blue Origin's GERT. Two trailers connected by cradles and supported by 22 axles and 176 tires towed by a repurposed US Army tank transporter. It's called GERT because it's an acronym that stands for Giant Enormous Rocket Truck. <laughs> now that the booster has reached the pad, the next big step to look forward to is Integrated Launch Vehicle Hot Fire, which will not only include the second stage but also the stacked payload. Then it's just flight termination installation and FAA approval before we finally see a true Falcon rocket competitor launch. Hopefully it sticks the landing first time. Laon Aerospace was back in action last week, not once, but twice. I decided to revisit Kerbal Space Program 2 for Halloween, considering it's now a dead game, so, you know, spooky themes and all that. But after publishing that video, it became clear that a large number of people still weren't all that aware of what happened with the doomed KSP sequel, and so on Saturday, I made a little PSA video comparing KSP 1 and KSP 2, and why you should only only consider buying the OG and not the abandoned KSP2. If either of those videos sound like a fun time, then check them out on my channel, or you know, one of them might be one of those cards on screen. But yeah, that's the end of Space This Week today, so thank you so much for watching. Big thank you if you're one of the people on the right there who support what I do here on Patreon or my YouTube member program and make all of this content possible. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'll see you all in the next video. Well, I won't see you, but you know, you'll hear my... I, I will just... I'll.